Welcome to High Impact Living, the motivational speaking of Rick McDaniel, the noted author, international communicator, and senior pastor at Richmond Community Church in Richmond, Virginia. Human beings have always been explorers. We explore. We have curiosity. Marco Polo went east to explore what was then considered the Orient. Columbus went west to explore what became America. Bird went north to find the North Pole. Almondson went south and discovered the South Pole. Lewis and Clark went across our country, America, to discover new lands. John Glenn went up into the sky, into the atmosphere, into space. And Neil Armstrong went all the way to the moon and stepped on it. Exploration, exploring, it's what we do. And it's good, it's good. Today, we embark on a new exploration, exploring God. Is it possible to explore God? Absolutely. Are there markers and directions just like north and south and east and west? Yes. And so today we'll begin and we'll spend the next six weeks exploring God. Looking at questions that all of us have about God and seeing if we can't discover answers just like these explorers discovered. The difference is this. If you discover new lands or go into space, that is very exciting and enriching for humanity. But if you explore God, you enrich your life in a completely new way. An entire new sphere of reality is open to you, the spiritual, not just the natural. And the fact that exploration on this earth is temporal, whereas exploration of God is eternal, it's well worth doing, and that's why I'm excited to kick off this series with you today. So welcome those of you here at the Glen Allen campus, and welcome those of you that are joining us on the internet campus as well as the High Impact Living broadcast. We're excited about this new series, so let's read out of the Bible. So take out of your information, guys, or follow along on the screen, and it's the book of Ecclesiastes, and we're going to read in chapter 2, verses 2 and 3 and 10 and 11, and then in chapter 12, verses 11 through 13. Let's begin in chapter 2. Laughing and having fun is crazy. What good does it do? I wanted to find out what was best for us during the short time we have on this earth. So I decided to make myself happy with wine and find out what it means to be foolish without really being foolish myself. I got whatever I wanted and did whatever made me happy. But most of all, I enjoyed my work. Then I thought about everything I had done, including the hard work. And it was simply chasing the wind. Nothing on earth is worth the trouble. Now to chapter 12, beginning with verse 11. Words of wisdom are like the stick a farmer uses to make animals move. These sayings from God, our only shepherd, and they are like nails that fasten things together. My child, I warn you to stay away from any teachings except these. There is no end to books, and too much to study will wear you out. Everything you were taught can be put into a few words. Respect and obey God. This is what life is all about. Who wrote these words? A man named Solomon, King Solomon. You may have heard of him. Considered to be the wisest man who ever lived. And the book of Ecclesiastes is a book that tells his journey of trying to learn about the purpose of life. Some of the verses in that book are very famous, and songs have been written from them. This is, by the way, the book that contains in chapter 3 the, the famous a time to this and a time to that, and there's a time for this and a time for that. That's where it comes from. When we encounter Solomon, in the beginning of the book, he is essentially discussing his exploration 
of life and the purpose of life. What you need to know about Solomon is, not only was he the wisest man who ever lived, he was one of the richest men who ever lived. He was a king. The queen of Persia came and brought gifts to him, and she's a pretty big deal herself. He was somebody who had at his disposal just about everything that our world would say is necessary to have a good time and a happy life. He had 900 wives and concubines, and don't even ask me to define a concubine. Let's just say this. Living together is not a new development. Could sleep with a different woman every night for years. Had all the money in the world you could ever want. Had vineyards, and isn't it funny in this era where wine is such a big deal? This guy lived almost 3,000 years ago, and so I decided to make myself happy with wine. 3,000 years later. Still trying that. He tried it all. He tried it all. Here's his summation. It's like chasing after the wind. It's like chasing after the wind. How do you you catch the wind? Can't catch the wind. It's it's maddening. How, How do you get it? How do you grab a hold of it? It's like chasing after the wind. In fact, what are his words? Nothing on earth is worth the trouble. That's how he started in the beginning, chapter 2. Then, at the end, the last book, chapter 12, he looks at things a little differently. What changed? I'd put it to you like this. There is a horizontal, horizontal viewpoint of life and a vertical viewpoint of life. And as long as you look at life horizontally, You end up like Solomon, chasing the wind. Some of you are here today because you are just so frustrated about life and whether life has really any meaning or purpose. Some of you have come to the conclusion that it doesn't. I would say it's because your viewpoint, your perspective, if you would, is solely horizontal. And as long as Solomon looked horizontally... He saw nothing that satisfied him. It was just chasing after the wind. It wasn't worth the trouble. But when he shifted his perspective vertically and brought in the God perspective, things changed. Listen to what he says. Everything you were taught can be put into a few words. Respect and obey God. This is what life is all about Respect and obey God. Does life have a purpose? Answer, short answer, yes. Long answer, that's what we'll talk about for the next few minutes. Here's where it starts. Get to know God. Get to know God. Shift from a horizontal perspective to a vertical one. When When Solomon says respect and obey God, to respect God means to get to know him. You can't respect one that you don't know. God is the one we go to for purpose and meaning. Now, some of you may say, well, hold on, Patrick. I don't know if there is a God. Well, that's next week's question. Is there a God? So come back. We'll explore that. Let's just start with an understanding, the vast majority of which people do believe, which is that there is God. There is a God, or God exists. It's God who gives purpose and meaning to life. A vertical perspective leads us out of a self-centered, self-oriented pursuit of life. In fact, here's the thing I have to tell you right now. If you came today, or you're watching or listening today, and you thought the message was going to be about Your purpose for life, that's not really what I'm going to talk about, your singular purpose. I'm going to talk about the larger purpose of life for all of us. Now, once you establish the larger purpose, you can funnel it and you can design it and you can focus it on your life, your individual life. But you can't start with you, you have to start with God. 
You have to start with a larger understanding, a bigger picture, if you would. And it begins by getting out of a self-oriented, self-centered viewpoint of life. Getting to know God. Why? Well, because listen, here's what I can tell you. Big news flash. Life is hard. Anyone want to say amen to that? Come on. Yes. Life is hard. Look at today and what we are remembering today. The harshness. The brutal nature of life. I mean, life will knock you down. Life is difficult. It is not for the weak or faint of heart. We need help. We need help that is greater than us. Good news. Help is on the way. God is ready to help. God is available to help us. If what is visible doesn't satisfy, then what does? Now some of you say, well, I don't know, Pastor Rick, I haven't had enough time to check all this stuff out to what is visible. And all I can say to you is the guy who had more money than you'll ever have, more women or men, whatever your gender, than you'll ever have, more power and influence than you'll ever have, he took the journey. And his summation was chasing the wind. A frustrating experience of chasing the wind. Feeling good, looking good, having the goods doesn't satisfy. Bam! There's the newsflash. Well, hold on. That can't be true, Pastor Rick, because that's all I've ever been told my entire life. Looking good, feeling good, having the goods. If you can have stuff, if you can, you can somehow feel good, whatever intoxicant that may be, if you could just look your best, you're on your way to a pleasurable, happy existence. By the way, it's not just Solomon. Some of you have heard me speak before, and you, for a while, I suppose, to hear me talk about those things. But I, I always like to talk about Elvis Presley and Howard Hughes. I just think they're two fascinating figures. Elvis Presley was called the king. I mean, that's pretty good. I mean, Solomon actually was a king, but Elvis Presley was called a king. Howard Hughes was an amazing person. I mean, just a brilliant visionary, super wealthy. Both of them, it didn't go so well. Their lives ended very poorly, and they ended never discovering life's purpose. Elvis Presley was introduced to Jesus at a young age. In fact, Elvis Presley went to, to the same church that my dad went to the church when my dad was in the Navy. He, he knew. He knew. I don't know that Howard Hughes ever knew. But you can run from God just like you can run to all kinds of other things. Unless what is unseen is in your life lasting enjoyment and purpose in life is impossible that is what solomon teaches us and that is what my experience has been on this earth you have to bring god into the picture whatever destination you're seeking if god is absent you will be left unsatisfied that's worth saying again because many people are on a destination, on a journey to some destination, and they think when they get there, that's finally going to be it. And isn't it amazing when you finally land their job, when you finally get married, when you finally have the child, when you finally reach the, the place of net worth that you've been searching for, isn't it amazing how it's not satisfying how it's not what you thought it would be. Why? Because of the God factor, because of the supernatural, because of the fact that we're on here on earth to know God. The wisest man who ever lived said, this is what life is all about. Respect and obey God. Respect 
and obey God. Get to know God and live to please God. That's what it means to obey God. To obey God means to live to please God. We're here on this earth to honor God with our lives. To live our lives in such a way that it brings pleasure to him. Not to seek out pleasure ourselves, but to understand that God has a purpose for this world, and he has a purpose for each of our lives. That God has to work in us in order to work through us. Too many want to do things and make a difference, which I'm totally for, and anyone who knows me and has ever read anything I've written or heard anything I've spoken, no, I'm a big believer in that. But, 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 with this qualification now, first you have to let God work in you and continue, by the way, to work in you. Life is essentially a moral journey, not a hedonistic one which hedonism means the seeking of pleasure. It isn't that pleasure is bad or wrong. It isn't that money is bad or wrong or having things or whatever else you may be seeking may be in and of itself wrong, but it is the focus on those things that steer us away from God's purpose. God's purpose is is about shaping us and molding us into the person he created us to be. In the book of Romans, chapter 8, verse 28, it says this. We are predestined. Let's just pause there. That's a big word. Let's just understand that this way. Our destiny is. We are predestined? Okay. Let's change it to this. Our destiny is to be conformed to the image of Christ. The word there for conform means to uh, cut out a a mold, to to make a mold that you could then recreate, to make the mold upon which all production pieces look just the same. uh, God's destiny for us is to be molded and shaped to be like Jesus. Think about the song that we just sang uh, earlier in this service in which We sang words like, help me to love like you love. Break my heart for what breaks yours. Help me to see the unseen and not just the seen. This is God's purpose for us. In other words, the great challenge of life is this. The struggle against our own sinful nature. The ability to be formed, to have our character shaped, to be less like our self-oriented sinful selves and more like a others-oriented God-selfless self. Ultimate meaning comes with a life in which moral purposes give it worth. In which we understand that it isn't so much just what we do as who we are. That to get to the end of your life having accomplished worldly success, however that's defined, but I think we know how that's defined. Looking good, feeling good, having the goods, you know. Having all the stuff, That the world would say, this is life. And being a person who is not moral, who does not rein in their own sinful, selfish tendencies, who has, in effect, alienated all kinds of people, stepped on people, hurt people, used people, that is not a successful life regardless of what the outward trappings may say. Here's the truth today, friends. Here is the absolute truth. We are marvelously gifted and deeply flawed. Every one of us. We're marvelously gifted and deeply flawed. We have certain marvelous talents and certain significant weaknesses. And the purpose of life 
is to enhance the talents to develop the gifts while at the same time correcting the flaws and strengthening the weaknesses. That is the purpose of life. Respect and obey God. Get to know who God is. Live your life to please God. That's why Solomon says these words, everything you were taught, everything you were taught, these sayings come from God. There is marvelous wisdom in the Bible about how to live your life. Character is built in the struggle against your own selfish weaknesses, against your own selfish orientations. This is why uh, pride is in many ways the original sin, because pride says, I don't have any weaknesses. Pride says, I know everything I need to know. Pride says, I don't need God's help. It's pride. It's a, it's a, a wrong belief. It's a sinful belief way of thinking that causes us to say, hey, uh, you know, I'm good. I'm not perfect, but I mean, who is? I'm sure a lot better than him or her. The comparison standard is not a comparison standard against other people. The comparison standard is the standard against Jesus. 33 years on this earth, never sinned one time. How you doing with that? Wow, I mean, well, come on, Jesus. Yeah, Jesus. That's the standard. Conform to the image of Christ. The purpose of life is for us, year after year, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, to become more like Jesus. To allow God to shape us. We, we need to be skeptical of our desires. We need to be aware of our weaknesses. And we need to be intent on combating our flaws. That's the purpose of life. Well, that sounds hard, Pastor Rick. Yes, it is. It is. I, I'm a straight shooter. Those of you who haven't heard me speak before, I'm, I don't, I'm not going to lie to you now as a pastor. It is. Now, Hard does not mean impossible. Many have come before us have done it. There was this lady, Mother Teresa, that just got recognized here this week. Catholic Church calls her a saint. Bible says we're all saints, but that's okay. She's a godly woman. Can we all agree with that? <laughs> Serving the poorest of the poor. God shaped and molded her life. People criticize her, say she took money from dictators, blah, blah, blah. I don't know all about that, but I know this much. No one's perfect. We all mess up and make mistakes, but that's no reason to go, you know, that's how I am. No, no. Aware of your weaknesses, sure. And skeptical of your desires. Just because you want something doesn't mean you should have it. The Bible is an old word in the Ten Commandments, coveting. It's not a word we use today, but that's what coveting means. You know, to want something that we, don't, we shouldn't have. And we have a very covetous world. And social media has created more covetousness than in the history of the world. How about that? Do you see how I put social media and covetousness in the same sentence? That's not easy to do. But it's true. Which is, you know, that's an old word. It just means, you know, comparison, wanting what other people have. God wants us to focus on ourselves. We have to draw on something outside of ourselves to help us deal with the forces inside ourselves. And that is God. God, the Holy Spirit, the Bible says, comes alongside of us to strengthen us and to help us to become the person that God has created us to be. We have the help. Help is on the way. All you have to do is ask for it. 
God will come and help you. He will give you strength. Well, I can't seem to break this habit. I'm sure you can't. How about if God's help came into the picture? Might that change it? Well, I don't know. Why don't you try? The help that God gives us is the only way we can become the people that he's created us to be. This lifelong journey of being shaped and molded and having our character formed to be more godly and less sinful, to be more like Jesus and less like Rick, fill in your name in the blank. That's the purpose of life. Now, as that is happening, sure, there is a way for us to make a difference. Yes, there is a plan and purpose that God has for our lives using the gifts and talents and opportunities that he gives us. Absolutely. Positively. So it's not as if we can't do anything else except work on ourselves. This is where, say, the monastic movement, in my opinion, went wrong. To just sort of go away from the world and totally work on the development of character, but leave the world behind. No, there's a work for you to do in your career, in your ministry, in your family. But, but, you have to allow God to work in you so that he can work through you. You have to be willing to let him shape you and mold you. You have to fight against those desires. You have to work on strengthening your weaknesses. And when you do, you live out your purpose in life. We're here on earth to know God and to live a life pleasing to God. This is what life is all about. Respect and obey God. Pastor Rick will return in just a moment with some closing words of encouragement. Before he does, I wanted to remind you about our webpage, www.highimpactliving.com. It's your resource for a high impact life. Let's pray together, will you? Close your eyes with me for just a moment. I promise nothing strange will happen in these moments just as your eyes are closed. I ask you to do it for the purpose of focus. And as we finish out, I just want to ask you this question very personal question, even though it's a large group of people. And, but it's as if you and I were just talking one-on-one. -on -one. And, the, and the question is, are you allowing God into your life to shape and mold your character? Is that happening? And if it isn't, that's the place to begin. That's the first point to start with. To let God fulfill his purpose in your life. This is what life is all about. Getting to know God and living your life to please him allowing God to work in you and change you and shape you and mold you. When that happens, and this is God's marvelous design, you end up really being a force for good. Your life ends up touching and blessing many, many other people's lives. That's God's plan. God uses you to help other people. You can see now if that plan was being fulfilled, if that purpose was in fact being accomplished, our world would be a radically different place. But neither you nor I are responsible for the world, but we are responsible for ourselves. So let's begin with us. Lord, I just pray for each person listening to my voice today. And my prayer is that they would come to know you, or if they already know you, that they'd come to know you better. That they would live their lives to please you, to honor you. That they would allow you to shape them and mold them, 
to develop their character, to battle against their weaknesses and their selfish tendencies, to develop those qualities that you want them to have that you know can be used to really positively impact other people's lives. That kind of journey begins with a first step. And I pray that first step begins today. In Jesus' name, amen.